This is the College of Complexes. We're here from Andy Anderson of the Northwest Information Service of in Palatine. We have a few rules. First rule is one fool at a time. And that's so that the rest of us can hear what's going on. Uh, and uh, the uh, second rule is that we do not insult anybody here personally or their parentage. Okay? Uh, beyond that, uh, our ideas are pretty much fair game. Our speaker, nobody needs an introduction if they are Andy L.P. Anderson. Oh boy, Andy! <laughs> Good evening, everyone. Uh, my name is Andy Anderson. I'm from the Northwest Information Service in Palatine. And um, tonight, uh, what we're going to do, I'm, I'm going to give you a, a summary of several hundred thousand person years worth of published forensic evidence on several subjects that are blacked out by the American press. Do you need a minute? Okay. <laughs> no. You know, if you looked in the program, tonight's talk is, we're, we're talking about mythology, mythology in America, how um, specific, specifically people have a tendency to believe certain myths that are promoted by the media long after the forensic evidence is published and the rest of the world is moving forward with the documented reality. Uh, America only has 5% of the world's people, but the media maintains our population in a state of uh, mythological ignorance, uh, a bubble, a bubble of mythology uh, where people growing up in America believe a different history than uh, what is learned around the world. For those of you that, there's uh, on the back table back here in the corner, if anybody's interested, there's seven distinct pieces of literature I brought tonight. I'll mention them just briefly. The one that the talk revolves around is this one, the beige article called 37, the two numbers, 30-7. And that, that's from a quote out of uh, Professor Griffin's book, The New Pearl Harbor. A friend of his told uh, Professor Griffin, he said, David, you don't need an open mind to understand this evidence. You need a 30% open mind and a seventh grade education. That's how easy it is to understand. 30% open mind, seventh grade education, and it's very easy to understand if you're not maintaining yourself in a bubble of mythological ignorance. The second piece of, uh, people always ask me, um, are there, if, if some of these things are true, why aren't people speaking up? Well, the gray flyer here is a, a, a page off of a website called Patriots Question 911, and it says 41 U.S. counterterrorism and intelligence veterans challenge the official count of 911. There's hundreds of intelligence professionals in our country alone who have been challenging the official fairy tale story of 9-11 since it was sold to us by the media on the day of 9-11. The third piece of literature is a single page also. It's called Update 2015 Seeking Justice for 9-11 Victims. And in many, many organizations now are making a strong case that any law enforcement or government official anywhere in the country who still promotes the official story of 9-11 is actively involved in obstruction of justice, covering up for the criminals that actually orchestrated the crime. Because the evidence is well published all over the world, there's no debate anymore about what happened on 9-11 or who covered it up. The only the first question you need to ask yourself about that myth is on this flyer, it's called uh, Forensic Evidence Update on 9-11. You just start with one single fact, and it's easy to understand. The two twin towers in New York 
did not collapse to the ground from any effect from a plane crash. The two twin towers themselves were spread over lower Manhattan as a cloud of microscopic fine powdery dust. They were dustified in seconds. Now there were bigger particles of dust that weren't microscopic, of the consistency of flour perhaps, but overall the two twin towers were subjected to a dustification process with some kind of massive explosives. So all you need to do to understand 9-11 is just ask that simple question, where did the towers go? And you go from there. That proves, uh, that one fact alone proves that the two plane crashes or whatever looked like plane crashes, the effects were magician smoke and mirrors. Had nothing to do with the destruction of the towers. Incidentally, uh, some of you may not know that all seven of the Trade Center buildings were demolished with explosives that day. We were told there were two plane crashes, but all seven of the buildings were demolished to some uh, degree pretty much leveled with explosives. Um, here's a flyer that I, I just pulled out and made copies from 2009. It's called uh, there's two sides of it. One of them is called the three biggest myths of 9-11. Three big myths that are being promoted by the public, uh, the media, the war in Iraq, the AIDS epidemic, and 9-11. Uh, those three things, what is promoted by the press and what is reported, is not really what's going on. And the other, the other one is a summary also with references from, you can see the, the basic summary from 2009, what we're looking at is the tip of a very large iceberg. Um, another, there's a four page, there's two four page flyers back here that are really worth uh, collecting and reading. One of them is by Paul Craig Roberts. He said, Nine, are we getting a, a feedback out of this microphone, Tim? A little bit, I'll what, turn it down. Can you turn it down just a little bit? <clears throat> Testing, testing. Okay. Can everybody still hear? Can you hear back there okay? Oh, that's great. Uh, that, that's good. Um, this this four-page article written in, uh, came out in 2013, uh, I'm sorry, September of 2014, Paul Craig Roberts, and he wrote 9-11 after, 13 years later, where is our country now? A generation of Americans has been born into disdain and distrust of Muslims. A generation of Americans has been born into a police state. A generation of Americans that have been born into a society in which truth is replaced with endless repetition of falsehoods by the media. That's what we're getting today. Endless repetition of falsehoods. And for those of you that again, the last piece of literature is a four page, I printed the first four pages of a, um, a website, one of the sections on that website of Patriots Question 9-11, that section has 242 pages of senior military intelligence officials, law enforcement, government officials, thousands of government officials, law enforcement officials are speaking out and blowing the whistle on the myth of 9-11, what we were told that Muslims did it. It's not just one or two people with an opinion, it's a massive database now. So, this book, incidentally, is a book called Don't Believe It, How Lies Become News. It describes how false stories get entered into the media and are reported by so-called professional journalists who don't do their homework, they don't dig into the evidence, and they don't... Uh, they don't question. Uh, several times in the past I've given uh, talks... Let me, Just, just timer, timer went south. Never mind. Um, Censored 9, uh, 2015. This is the, the 2015 edition of Censored News. Comes out of Sonoma State University. Has the top 25 blacked out stories that will change America overnight. 
if it were covered rather than blacked out. Now occasionally we'll have some here at the, someone here at the college that will claim this is not a journalism project at all. It's, uh, the book, the, the Project Censored is one of the premier journalism, investigative journalism projects in the world. They get all kinds of journalism awards every year. And people that work in uh, the media in Chicago, a couple people I'm familiar with, I won't mention any names, they'll come up to me after a talk like this and say, why do you call this a journalism project? It, it's kind of like, as I've said before, it's like talking to a sports writer that's been here for 25 years in Chicago and says, why do you keep talking about this Michael guy? Uh, Michael, I've never heard of Michael. How is it possible to live in Chicago and not know who Michael Jordan is? You're, sta you're standing in a blizzard of evidence claiming you can't see a single snowflake. That's, that's what uh, this Alexandra Kitty, uh, what she talks about. She says people have certain kinds of mental uh, disorders, uh, the way they view the world. Uh, they're pretty much normal in all ex aspects except when you come to a, a specific subject, this or that. Uh, th th they will look at facts and not see the reality at all. They just go on believing a myth long after you know the reality has been published. What I do, uh, my brother and I, we collect books and, and, and do a translation as we call it, database translations. You take, take several books on a subject and condense that into a one-page cliff notes that somebody can read in five minutes because there's no time to read 20 books a week. There's a massive amount of knowledge and solid evidence exists in books. People have spent you know, years publishing one of these books, doing research. And it's, some of these books are a collaboration of you know, dozens or hundreds of scientists collectively uh, trying to move the, the subject forward. Like the database on uh, cigarette smoking. We still have some people in the country that smoke, but they don't really contend anymore that secondhand smoke is not a hazard for children or uh, that you can smoke four packs a day and it won't have any adverse effects on your health because the answer is no. Forty years ago, some of you may have remember the television commercials where they had doctors uh, advertising for cigarettes. My doctor smokes Chesterfields. You know, put zest in your life. Somebody's laughing over like they like they remember those commercials on TV. Well, that that's how knowledge spreads, um, you know, through a population. It's it's what we call um, the exponential curve, the Galileo curve. Galileo was first. He published the the theory that the Earth is not the center of the universe; that the Earth revolves around the sun. And he got arrested and prosecuted for it because it went against the teaching of the time. But people came along behind him with telescopes and said, hey, he was right. And so on, on many key subjects, you have somebody that's first, they publish the reality, uh, what's really happening, and they get attacked from all sides by the powers that be that don't want that knowledge spreading out into the population. And we've seen that on, uh, in tobacco. You see it in toxic waste. Uh, in America, it takes a while in America for lawsuits to come up through the courts. Today, you can no longer claim that in, uh, you can run an asbestos factory and uh, have your workers breathing asbestos dust claiming that it's not a health hazard anymore. Because the answer is known, a lot of lawsuits have been settled, and there's still uh, a huge, as, as I understand it, uh, there's a body of money that's been put aside in the settlements for workers that are still uh, getting sick from the health hazards years ago. It's like... Um, what do you do with Albert Einstein? If Albert were alive today and 500 of his friends from the physics departments, suppose they would send a letter to the president saying, Mr. President, we'd appreciate it if you stop saying the earth is flat. We got pictures from the space shuttle. What are you gonna do with a group like that? Four or 500 physicists, 10, 15, 20 years, 30 years experience among them, and they, they question 
flat earth ignorance that's being put out by the media. Well, there's no way to combat the body of evidence, and so you do what the tobacco industry pioneered, you know, 25 years ago, you create doubt. You're, they said our, our primary product now is doubt because there is no way to combat the body of facts. So all you do is create doubt. On, 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 some, on many different key subjects today, there's articles in the paper that uh, uh, create doubt and confusion. Uh, we're not getting the straight story of what our troops are doing in Iraq and Afghanistan because if the American public knew, they would be outraged. So the press uh, creates various doubt. There are a new book uh, just, here's a new book that just hit the, the bookstores in the last few weeks. It's called The Rise of ISIS. ISIS is that new supposed terrorist group over there in the Middle East that is uh, every bit as bad as Al-Qaeda was. Well, the ri ISIS uh, is, uh, the rise of ISIS is funded by various uh, groups, you might say, that get money from the CIA and the Israeli Mossad. It's not just a group of Islamic fanatics over there. Sure, ISIS I mean. is taking the place of Osama bin Laden. Osama bin Laden was the boogeyman for almost a, over a decade, and now that it's known that he's dead, we have to have a new threat. And so it's ISIS. After Once it's proven that this group is not really what the media is telling us, we'll have a new terrorist threat. And they, uh, this stems from uh, the end of the Cold War. The Soviet Union maintained the, they played the role of the boogeyman for all through the Cold War, almost 30 years or something, and then when the Berlin Wall came down in 1989, people were saying, well, why can't we start spending some of this military money on peace? And all of a sudden, the military-industrial complex found some Islamic terrorists in Iraq, and uh, we had their first Iraq the Gulf War in 1991, but they have to keep the war machinery going. I'll touch briefly on the four, four myths that are driving what's happening in America today are on this flyer, this 30, 37. You don't need an open mind. You need a 30% open mind and a seventh grade education to understand any one of these things if you just have the ability to read and look at the evidence. The first myth on there, of course, myth number one, the granddaddy of all myths in modern times is that we were attacked by Osama bin Laden on 9-11. That's a total myth. And the evidence is so overwhelming now that we have professional disinformation specialists that will come up to the podium and create doubt uh, after a speech like this. We saw a disinformation specialist two weeks ago come up to the podium and uh, distribute literature in, uh, in Ted's, Ted's talk on 9-11 two weeks ago. A man drove in here from Rockford to give us printed literature that's 180 degrees opposite of observable reality that can be understood by a fifth grader. Now, so my question is, you know, why why would he be doing that if the answer is known? Well, it's to create doubt, to slow down the spread of knowledge. Because 9-11 is driving the myth of uh, our military fighting for freedom and justice in foreign lands. Which one is that? That's, not, that's myth number three on here. Um, but those number one and three are closely related. We're told, support the troops, support the troops, support the troops everywhere. Well, if you want to know what the troops are doing, you don't have to read the last hundred books. Along with General Smedley Butler wrote a book in 1935 and it was republished. Is anybody here familiar with this book, War is a Racket? How many hands? A couple hands. There's informational groups all over the country that are, are trying to get this book into eighth grade uh, classes. They say that to give every, every young American, man or woman, a fair shot at understanding what's going on before they are exposed to military recruiters, they should read this book in eighth grade, they and their parents, Could because you? it describes what, what General Butler said he said, uh, I was muscle for the mob. We weren't defending freedom. Uh, we were clearing the land and making it safe for United Fruit Company, Standard Oil. Uh, 
What was the name of that book, Andy? The name of the name of that book is is War is a Racket. It's a little book. It's about twelve bucks. You can get it anywhere online at Barnes and Noble. It describes the racket. The military industrial complex makes a bundle of money during armed conflicts, and it's all about money. If you don't have time to read that book or a uh, hundred last hundred others on our military industrial complex. You can simply watch this two and a half hour movie. It's called Avatar. It was it came out in 2010, 2010, in December, about four four years ago, and it describes in the fictional story of our military protecting the mining operation on some planet far away. It describes exactly what our military has been doing in Iraq, in Afghanistan. So the idea that our military is supporting freedom and justice all over the world is again a very large myth. We have five percent of the world's people and we support a military with a budget that is almost equal to the rest of the world combined. Yeah, in round numbers if you add it all up our military budget is about a trillion dollars a year. Um, Professor uh, David Michael Green wrote an article about four years ago called, you know, one number. You just need to understand one number if you want to know what's happening to American middle class, and that number is a trillion dollars. A trillion dollars a year going down the military rattle. I just came back from the um, Air Force Museum in Dayton, Ohio. It, uh, I would recommend everybody go visit that museum sometimes to see uh, just walking through it in the three huge hangars with uh, bombers, missiles, aircraft, uh, a whole history of uh, how much, how many hundreds of billions, actually trillions of dollars have been spent on military hardware by our, our country, you know, since World War I. It's an amazing, amazing display of spending money on stuff that doesn't help society move forward. The third myth in there that uh, is related to these other two is the myth that the American people in their wisdom or maybe perhaps in their lack of wisdom elected George Bush and Dick Cheney to be our president and vice president. The media sold us the myth both times that the vote was close but George and Dick won when the reality is something totally, totally different. The reality of what happened in 2000 is spelled out in these two books. The first 2000, one of them is, this one is by Mark Crispin Miller. This came out in 2005. It's called Fooled Again. Fooled Again. And it's how we were fooled again after uh, the 2000. It, it took a while to get books out that added up the statistical analysis and uh, all the numbers to show that the vote totals in 2000 didn't add up. People on the ground knew initially, they knew immediately that George lost the election and the Supreme Court stopped the vote counting in Florida and gave it to Bush. Bush was never elected and neither was Dick Cheney. This one, this other book came out in 2008 that gives more of an update a summary of the vote fraud that's been going on. Not just Bush and Cheney, but other Senate, key senators and congressmen have been installed in their offices through massive vote fraud and just outright treasonous activities by criminals occupying mainly the Republican Party. We, we've been involved in a massive amount of treason in this country with our elections to uh, put criminals in office like uh, Rick Scott in Florida, uh, the governor should be in jail for uh, his his part in uh, a huge amount of Medicare fraud. I believe it was uh, he had he headed up a health care company of the HMO of some kind, and uh, they they had to pay a fine of 1.7 billion dollars or something to settle. But he wasn't prosecuted. He was allowed to go on and uh, spend a lot of his own money and run for governor, and they installed him as governor. We have these right-wing governors around the country that have been installed with massive vote fraud 
where they weren't really elected by the people. These two books spell that out for anybody that's interested. And they're, they're loaded with references also, references to websites, who crunched the numbers, uh, all kinds of things, where it's just not in the mainstream media at all. What's, what's the Red Book called? Uh, the, oh, I'm sorry. The, the Red Book is uh, it's edited by Mark Crispin Miller. No. That one is called Loser Take All. Loser Take All, Election Fraud and the Subversion of Democracy in two, from 2000 to 2008. And since these were published, more and more evidence has just been piled on. What, what's here is just the tip of a very large iceberg. So we, we started in 2000 with the election of George, and then nine months after that, a bunch of key people that produced a report called the Project for New American Century, they, they were installed in key places throughout the American government. So they, they occupied the offices to successfully orchestrate the event that we know as 9-11 and they were in key places also to cover it up and prevent any investigation until the families of the victims, after a year, the families put so much pressure on the Bush government that they had to convene a commission. So the commission, uh, they wrote the report before they took any evidence or testimony from anyone, and they put out a report uh, in 2004 called the 9-11 the Commission Report. And as Professor Griffin wrote, that report was a 571 page lie from start to finish and it was the same thing as the Warren Commission who wrote the report about the lone gunman theory in 1963 when Kennedy was assassinated by a coalition of people from the Mafia and the CIA. So what's emerging now is a pattern what's emerging is a pattern of people working behind the scenes. What um, the Canadian uh, diplomat uh, called Peter Dale Scott is his name. He's a veteran diplomat. Uh, he wrote, he's written several books. This one is called The American Deep State. And uh, Wall Street, Big Oil, and the Attack on Democracy. It's brand new, came out of, you know, a few months ago. The American Deep State, Wall Street, Big Oil, and the Attack on U.S. Democracy. And he describes rich people behind the scenes, rich bankers who've had control of our media and our military now since World War II really, or after World War I, they, they started preparing for World War II. But he talks about the, the assassination of President Kennedy was done to move the country, move the country in a different direction. Kennedy was going to move the country toward peace and that was unacceptable to what President Eisenhower called the military-industrial complex. The people that make huge profits off of war and conflict. That's why we're having constant conflicts in the Middle East. It's, it's, it's a way to keep the trillion dollar war machinery up and running and producing huge profits every year. All of this this trillion dollars a year going down the military rat hole is driven uh, by the idea that we're defending America one way and also it's the free enterprise system making profits and just letting the market decide things. Uh, the idea is Reaganomics. In 1980, they installed Ronald Reagan for the purpose of beginning to shift America toward what we saw in 2008. Uh, runaway bankers, every 80 years, they produce a huge bubble and basically try to take back as much equity as they can from the poor and the middle class. It's an 80-year cycle that Tom Hartman talks about. For those of you that uh, would really be interested in learning what, what is actually economically happening in America today, here's two really good books. That are, this is from 2013. It's called How America Was Lost by Paul Craig Roberts. Also, I didn't have a copy of his other book. It's called uh, The Failure 
of laissez-faire capitalism. That came out in, uh, what, uh, 2013, a, a year and a half ago. But Paul Craig Roberts was a uh, longtime former assistant secretary of the treasury, and um, he had a long career. He was a Republican, uh, and he had a long career in Republican administrations, and when he finally retired, like uh, General Butler, he started speaking out, and uh, his work is very, very understandable about where we are today and why the, the middle class has been under attack for 35 years since Ronald Reagan was elected. The other book is a little book called The Economics of Revolution. This one is, uh, yeah, it's about 80 pages. And then David DeGraw is the author. Uh, you can print out uh, 20, 30 pages of a time. You can actually print the book off of uh, the internet for free if you don't want to buy the book. It's about $15. But he gives you the numbers, the actual numbers of who's employed in America, how many full-time jobs there are, how many part-time jobs there are, and how the media has just been flat out lying to us for 40 years on the subject of employment in America. Just bald-faced lies. The idea that we have 6% unemployment or seven is laughable. Because he makes a very strong case. He said, you know, there's, there's 213 million full-time adult Americans that need a full-time job. There is now only 106 million full-time jobs in America, period. 60,000 factories and millions and millions of good-paying jobs have been moved out of this country and the, the factory material, you know, the assembly lines, the presses, everything you need to manufacture American-made things, those are in other countries now. So the products you see in the stores look exactly the same like electrical switches and stuff made by Leviton. They, they look the same as the ones made six or eight years ago, but the only thing that's different on it is it says made in China, stand or made in Taiwan or something. It, it looks like coming uh, right off the American assembly lines because that's what they came off of. So uh, the idea that manufacturing in America would provide middle class jobs, that idea has been under attack now you know, for 35 years, and it really, really picked up speed as they started closing and moving factories in 2000 as soon as George W. Bush got control of the White House. So, we, you know, we, we teach seventh graders. Universal advice to seventh graders is, in order to solve any problem, you, you must first correctly identify the problem. And of course, you must first be able to uh, correctly admit that you even have a problem not just stand up a podium and lie to people. Like Ed Schultz from MSNBC says, you know how you win a debate? You just stand up there and lie your ass off until the time runs out. That's how you win a debate. Just stand up there and lie your ass off. And the average person, if they haven't read a book or two or three that gives them the information to know that you're lying to them, they don't know. And so you create doubt like the tobacco industry did for years and years and years. So if you look at the forensic evidence on key subjects today, on 9-11, there's no doubt about what happened. On the unemployment situation, there, there's no doubt about what's going on. The middle class is being eliminated in America. America the American middle class and poor are, are just under all-out economic attack by sociopathic, psychopathic billionaires who oh, um, one website recently said, you know, the, the, the Queen of England is listed as the sixth richest person in the world at uh, 60 or 80 billion. But he said, if you, you add up the value of the land that supposedly she owns, you know, the Queen of England supposedly owns about one-sixth of the land mass of the earth. Her net worth is $22 trillion. And uh, the Rothschild banking family, their net worth is about $100 trillion. There's huge money concentrated in few hands. And for the, for the last 30 years, especially the last 15, America has been running the greatest welfare for billionaires system that the world has ever seen. The Bush administration shoveled more money upwards to billionaires in the shortest amount of time 
that in the history of our country. And it didn't slow down all that much when Obama got elected. So, uh, you know, there's a, that's a, a talk for another whole evening. You can talk about what happened and what didn't happen after the public voted in mass to vote the criminals out in 2008. You know, it's becoming more and more obvious to a lot of people. We didn't necessarily vote for President Obama because we were voting for a Democratic president so much as a lot of Republicans were voting to put an end to the Republican crime spree. They recognized that George and Dick weren't your average Republicans, that George and Dick ran a fantastically successful corporate crime machine. But the press doesn't cover this. It's in books. It's in books, magazines, internet sites. I'll list, uh, for those of you that might be interested in some really good websites, where I get a lot of my information, and then the, the, there's one called Want to Know Info, uh, and it's listed uh, on my cards. Anybody wants a card, uh, come up and see me afterwards. The Want to Know Info site has 12 different disciplines on it, and they, it's printer friendly. You can print a two page summary of the evidence that's highly credible, or 10 page, or 60 pages with references. So uh, their motto is, you know, for a brighter future. If we, if we all begin to learn what the problems are and move in a positive direction, things can get better. Like the people in Iceland. Uh, Iceland is a, a glaring example, a shining beacon of light, of hope. Iceland, and they arrested their bankers. They said, not only are we not bailing you out, you're going to jail. And uh, Greece right now is on the verge of telling some of their bankers the same thing, that we're not going to continue to let you devastate the middle class because of your criminal banking activities. And so there, there's a few articles in the press about criminal banking, but only the tip of the iceberg. There's a site uh, with veteran intelligence professionals from all over the world. It's called Veterans Today, led by a man named Gordon Duff. Gordon Duff is a uh, a Vietnam, uh, disabled Vietnam veteran who runs uh, the world's largest private intelligence service to uh, advise you know countries and companies on, on economic matters and a bunch of other things. But they published more really credible articles on what the Bush, Cheney, Obama administration has been doing and where we are militarily. Uh, the site is just loaded with all kinds of good articles. Project Censored, out of Sonoma State, said Project Censored has, has, has been up and running for 37 years. They have a website with the last 20 years or so of archives listed on that site. You can log right on, you don't have to buy the books. All 25 articles and a bunch of other stuff, junk food news, it's all there on that website. Huge archives. Paul Craig Roberts, as I mentioned in his article earlier, Paul Craig Roberts has a, an excellent website with his writings going back a number of years. Architects and Engineers for 9-11 Truth, A&E, who have, uh, they published uh, a bunch of stuff on 9-11 and also they have videos out like this one. Uh, this one is called The Anatomy of a Great Deception. If you don't have time to read a lot of books on 9-11, you can get a copy of this DVD and uh, in about 90 minutes they cover all the high points in a video that's easy to watch and understand. So, as I said, uh, another website that gives you the seven, the seven different categories of uh, patriots. Patriots question 9-11. It's a website that um, lists, they have the groups of, uh, with uh, names and little biographic information on these people in one place. So that here there's 220 senior military intelligence, law enforcement and government officials. There's uh, over 2,000 architects and engineers now. There's 250 pilots, veteran top gun, military, Navy, Marine pilots saying that the idea of what we were told about the planes on 9-11 is a total crock. The pilots have debunked everything, single piece 
of what we were told about the planes flying around 9-11. 400 professors from universities. Here's 400 medical professionals and then 200 artists, entertainers, groups of people that are putting their reputations and lives on the line to help people understand that the event known as 9-11 is the dark force that's driving the militarization of America and the, the uh, police, the gradual conversion of little police uh, departments around the country into SWAT teams with tanks and other stuff left over from Iraq and Afghanistan. The military has been funneling billions and billions of dollars of military hardware into small towns all across the country to create a heavily militarized atmosphere. So, understanding this can move us forward. Germany is showing the way. Germany has already put up enough solar panels and wind machines to shut down 22 nuclear power plants. Germany says, we don't have to fight over fossil fuels anywhere. So you don't have to occupy the Middle East. Just bring the troops home. Start making hybrids, electric cars, all kinds of stuff, high efficiency houses. If we adopted the German standard of efficiency, we wouldn't need foreign oil from anywhere. And that's not even counting the later knowledge that's come out showing uh, what Harvey Wasserman called a solar topian revolution. He published a book in 2007, eight years ago, said if we go in the direction of efficiency, move in the direction of efficiency, by 2030 you can be running America with no coal, no oil, no gas, and no nukes. Completely off of fossil fuel and make huge profits. Oh, another website that describes that is Rocky Mountain Institute. Rocky Mountain Institute is the world's foremost energy efficiency resource center up in the mountains of Colorado. They got a 3,000 square foot house as a demonstration. The founder of RMI, uh, Amory Lovins and his wife lived there for years. It's a 3,000 square foot house up in the mountains where it's cold. They got no heating bill and a five dollar a month electric bill for that place. Now, since they put up some more solar panels and they redid their windows again, their windows have four layers of glass. And so, the house is a net producer of energy all year round. And they, they feed electricity in the grid and get a check back from their local utility. Germany looks at every building as a source of energy, electrical energy, for the, uh, the community and the country. These kinds of things are happening all over the world, but the American press doesn't cover it because it would change our outlook on how we view what our politicians are doing. Occasionally somebody from an audience will say, well, Andy, if, if what you're saying is true, that would presuppose some of our politicians have been lying to us. Hello? If, Andy, if what you're saying is true, that means some of the billionaire owners of the media might not be totally honest with us. Hello? How much longer is it going to take before we'll adopt Professor Griffin's 30.7 attitude. 30% open mind and a 7th grade education. That's all you need to understand any of this. If you're just willing to read the forensic evidence, which is absolutely overwhelming on a whole bunch of topics. I guess uh, that's it. We'll uh, open, the, uh, open it up for questions. The first myth I'm going to challenge you on. The first question comes from Tim Bolger. Tim Bolger has the first question, the number one first question of the night. Okay. What's up, Tim? Well, when I look at uh, Germany's electricity mix in 2013, you're saying it's been covered by solar and all this stuff. Well, then how can you how can you have an answer why, according to the official German electrical website that's still 45 percent is coming from coal and why that's grown so much and why about 20 percent of their electric power is now coming from France which has about 90 percent nuclear. Okay, uh, Tim asked your question. Uh, and this is according to the, to, to the uh, official website of the German 
electrical electrical association and what what where are the actual power is coming from okay no uh, nobody is saying that countries aren't using fossil fuels they still are yes france france is exporting electricity out of their nuclear program which was supported by their nuclear weapons program. The nuclear power, nuclear weapons industry go hand in glove. In all the major countries, the two industries with the key players are one and the same. You, you don't have a massive nuclear power industry anywhere in the world where that country doesn't have a nuclear weapons program also. So the major, it's, it's France, Germany, Great Britain, uh, Russia, China, in America, the six big ones that have both nuclear power, nuclear weapons programs. France pushed nuclear power off on their citizens by promoting electricity. They, they were building load, in other words. And as the citizens of France have gone more efficient, France is suddenly stuck with a massive a surplus of electricity that they can sell to other countries. And Germany will take some of it. Uh, the coal industry is still very powerful. You have to understand the fossil fuel industry is fighting green energy all across the planet as fast as they can. So uh, that's what's going on, and it's a battle right now. Uh, and you see, you'll have, um, you know, depending on the news that comes out, they try to downplay, everywhere they can, they're downplaying the cont contribution that is being made by uh, growing solar and wind power. Solar and wind power are the two fastest growing forms of energy in the world. They're leaving everything else in the dust as far as growth every year with capacity. And the fossil fuel industry, in answer to Tim's question, yes, the coal, oil, nuke, and gas industry, they're fighting back as much as they can. But how long can you, uh, you know, stick your finger in the dike and hold back the flood? It's an idea whose time has come. So we'll, we'll hear more about it. Our own Commonwealth Edison put out a report two years ago that said by the middle of 2015, two-thirds of American households will have access to cheaper solar electricity on their roofs compared to what the utilities are selling it to them for. That's that's coming up this year. It's not five or ten years in the future. Okay. Another question? Diane? Okay, uh, it, it, it's probably incorrect to say that the buildings were completely dustified. They were 99% uh, of the material was, 98-99% yeah, was converted to dust. The rubble pile on the ground, two, three stories high with some girders down there, that was what everybody saw. That rubble pile should have been 10, 20 times higher than it was if the, the bulk of it hadn't been converted to dust and spread over lower Manhattan. Does that answer that part of your question? What's the other part? Okay. You're saying that it took massive amounts of explosives to the building. But this is true. How were these things planted? These massive amounts of material planted in the building. Now, anybody can look at it by themselves. And how does all this, I mean, some of you have seen all of these things coming into the building, massive amounts of explosives. Yeah, she just asked a question. She said somebody must have seen the massive amounts of explosives being brought into the buildings if they were prepped, you know, days or weeks in advance. And that's absolutely correct. If you there's a 42-minute video called 9/11 Finally Solved, and it, it tells you it shows you with uh, videos, uh, uh, graphics. How the, the floors, the floors where uh, we were told the plane crashes hit, where the massive explosions were, those floors were taken over by uh, companies that were friendly to Bush and Cheney and had military contacts. You know, the, the two spots that were hit in the two towers, the, those floors were occupied by 
what you would call uh, bush friendly contractors and also other people other people have been reporting for years that the towers were like three quarters empty the buildings were losing money they were three quarters unoccupied there were a lot of empty floors and in the five days leading up to 9-11 People reported seeing trucks rolling in around 3 o'clock in the morning after everybody had gone home, you know, wheeling in dumpster size uh, stuff. There was a lot of rumbling going on in a lot of floors. So there are reports of a lot of activity of heavy, you know, heavy machinery and everything else being brought into the buildings in the final, final two weeks or so. So you know, it wasn't like this was a big surprise or that it was unknown. It's that what, the very thing you asked, all the witnesses that saw this, they, none of them were ever permitted to testify before the 9-11 Commission. There's hundreds of them, hundreds of people report what you just asked. You know, there's all kinds of eyewitnesses. This is not a secret. It's just blacked out by the mainstream news media. So you were... Well, you have to realize the country was in a state of shock. I mean, it, it uh, initially researchers didn't even think to ask if you know, a lot of people, like Professor Griffin said, it, it took him until 2004. He accepted the official story until early in 2004 when a friend of his set a video and said, David, take a look at this. And he, and he asked a question and he started researching. A lot of researchers didn't really get started looking at these. It takes a while to look at look back through the records. Uh, well, you know, they have to look back through the lease records. Who was leasing that floor for, you know, between 1997 and 98? Who had it between 98 and 2001? It, you have to pour over those records. And that's what these videos are showing now in the books, is uh, who orchestrated the whole operation. Okay? All right, Dan Weber. Uh, yeah, Andy, you have a lot of evidence, but... Are, are there any people from the companies, the explosives companies, who came in and admitted that they actually set explosives? Did anybody say that in all these witnesses for the 9/11 Commission, or was uh, that or was that hidden from you? Uh, the people that uh, there, yes, there are there are testimonials now of people that claim they worked. There's several that have claimed they worked in the demolition companies. That it's on, uh, that it's in available in books. I say it's not in the media. If you're asking, did they testify before the nine commission? No. The commission, the commission ignored all eyewitness testimony that would refute the official fairy tale. So you won't find any of this in official sources. It's all in what, what's called the, the citizen investigation that's going on nationwide. Uh, and also, one guy, there's an article, one guy from a demolition company spoke out. He had a, a strange accident and was killed uh, a week after he spoke out. So uh, there have been uh, several suspicious deaths of people that spoke out. And uh, this is why a lot of others, their lips are sealed. Okay. That is true. Yes, David Travis. Yeah, my question is this, when um, if George Bush and Dick Cheney were not really elected and that they were put into office uh, by way of uh, crooked vote counting, then it would seem to me that once uh, they had a... Um, method of doing this crooked vote counting that they would never let go of. So therefore, how is it then that uh, Barack Obama got elected? The question is, uh, the question is a good one. And it said, uh, if Bush and Cheney were put into office by um, fraudulent vote counting, uh, why would they not keep control of that and not, not ever let a Democrat or somebody else get elected? That's a very good question, and the answer to it is, by 2006, there were thousands of lawyers in the Democratic Party beginning to file lawsuits around the country for vote tampering and everything else. So by the time the 2008 
there was a, a groundswell of revulsion coming amongst the American people. In 2006, a lot of criminal Republican congressmen and senators were voted out. And then in 2008, the majority of people voting the criminals out were so large that there was no way to credibly steal the election. Does that make sense? Do you understand what I'm saying? That the country as a whole, uh, less than 18, 17 percent of all voters would vote for Bush Cheney in, in 2008. The country was disgusted. If you look back and remember, a whole bunch of millions of people that are normally hardcore Republicans said, these people aren't Republicans, they're criminals, we have to vote them out. We have to have a change of administration. So uh, Karl Rove threw in the towel early on in uh, the 2008 election, recognizing that it was such a landslide of votes. They doctored the votes in quite a few states. A lot of the vote totals were closer than they would have been if they hadn't been fraudulently doctored in 08, but the margin for victory was still so large that they couldn't steal it. That's why Barack Obama got elected. It was an overwhelming regurgitation of a criminal enterprise by the American voting public in 2008, something we haven't seen in a long, long time in this country. Uh, Charlie, and then uh, uh, Mike Slater. Yeah, Andy, and here you state that all the original videotapes of Osama bin Laden were fakes. I guess they were just some Arab guy? Oh, uh, is that, what's, your, what's your question, Charlie? My question is, okay, if all those are fakes, but then I vaguely recollect seeing the president and cabinet members, secretary of defense, and the chief of staff watching reports of their going to kill Osama bin Laden. How did they make that movie where they tricked into, I mean, they're watching the screen, reports from the Navy or whatever. How did they make that was that a theater production, or were they fooled? Okay, I mean, Charlie. They were watching, like, the cabinet room. Right. They, they were watching, basically, a, a theater production that uh, the people in Pakistan said that, uh, you know, people went over there and interviewed the people in that, that compound where Osama was supposed to have been living. He said he wasn't there. Uh, the Navy SEALs that went on that mission that supposedly captured him they were loaded onto a helicopter a little while later, a few weeks or something, and sent off in a, an Afghanistan mission, and they were all killed. The people on, uh, the, I forget the name of the ship, 6,000 sailors on this one ship where they said they gave Osama a burial at sea, they, they were writing emails to their friends but saying that never they, happened. In that room, did they get... What were they watching? Then? Well, they were they were part they were part of a psychological act. Well, who knows? Who you know? I mean, they, they certainly weren't weren't watching the capture of Osama bin Laden because the Middle Eastern newspapers reported Osama's funeral on December fifteenth of two thousand one. The video tape or something. They're 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 watching. It's it's a story that's made up. Uh, they you know they they're watching. Yeah. Yeah, the, the, the whole thing, you know, the, the, the Osama tapes, there's no credible evidence, uh, no, no video. No, I'm not, uh, Charlie, you're nitpicking. We're, what we're talking no, about is... They, are, they got them watching live of the, of the getting the guy. Well, they, 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 they went into a compound and, and captured some poor guy and killed him, but it wasn't Osama. That's what they're talking about. Phony no, not a phony tape, uh, an operation that was sold to the Americans as capturing Osama. They do this. They send some people off, they grab some poor guy and say, oh, he's a terrorist, we had to kill him. They've been doing this since 2001 with the uh, Iraq. We've been, we've been grabbing people off the streets and sending them to Guantanamo, all kinds of things. It's, it's been one huge myth-building operation sold to us as the hunt for Osama bin Laden. Hey, and, and, the video, and, and let me answer his other question. Uh, all of the videotape experts, video experts that their job is to analyze video, they've all said the same thing. They said the videos after December of 2001, the new videos that came out with Osama, 
They were made with Osama look-alike actors. Osama was dead in 2001. All those tapes, they're years later, he said Osama got younger and better looking as he aged. And then they finally, they couldn't ride the Osama Bin Laden Express anymore. As I said before, the, you know, the Indians have a saying, when you're riding a dead horse, you have to get up and change horses. Osama, the, the Bin Laden Express, you can't ride that horse anymore, it's dead. Now we got ISIS. And then after ISIS is dead, we can't ride that horse anymore, we'll have something else. They have to manufacture something each time. And then President Obama said, I gotta fire up the Bin Laden Express and we'll have to capture him and I'll, I'll get my poll numbers up so Democrats won't challenge me for the 2012 presidential election. That's why the capture of Osama Bin Laden was sold to us okay. in, in, that, in the summer of uh, 2011. The movie Zero Dark Thirty is widely regarded to be propaganda. I don't know. Uh, I can research it for you. Okay, let's next question. Next question. I didn't get an answer. Okay, uh Mike. Alright, so if we went to the manifest, I, I forget what you said about I don't want this to turn into a 9-11 thing. You said all the all the passengers on those four airplanes were hijacked and, and sent somewhere or something? Please if we went and tracked down the manifest of all those people on all four airplanes, went to their relatives, they would all say they were on a flight that morning, wouldn't they? Well, probably if you could find their relatives. But see, the, there's there's a lot of uh, there's a hazy information on uh, the four planes that we were told took off had very light loads, less than, you know like at 20 percent of the load, and uh, and they, you know they, they were supposed to, supposedly all four of those planes crossed over and landed in Cleveland and unloaded their passengers, and four of their drones took their places. The pilots for 9/11 Truth have made it very plain that the four planes that took off with the passengers weren't the four that crashed, supposedly. Not at the Pentagon, not in, 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 in you know, you know uh, the two Twin Towers. Uh, you know, it was, so the planes landed in Cleveland? Well, you know, we, we have a witness protection program in this country. We've been hiding people for years. So to, to hide a couple, uh, one or two hundred people, when, when you're talking about an operation this size that hundreds of billions of dollars are at stake, to, to hide a few, you know, a couple hundred people uh, and, and give them uh, new identities would be uh, a small piece of the charade, in other words. We may never find out where those people went. What? Well, they did, and you know, the air traffic controllers, uh, they, they had made a, a, a tape, an audio tape of what, what happened on that day, and then the head of the air traffic controller destroyed the tape. They said, we, we don't want anybody to hear what... Right, you know, you know and the, the, top people, the top people in the FAA, the top people in the FBI, the top, top levels of CIA, the top levels of the military, you had people in key positions to slow down the investigation and orchestrate the myth. That's what they're, they're talking about. Okay, that's the question. All right, let's see. Yeah. Okay. Well, I, I have two questions. Um, one is about these passengers on the airplane. Why would they agree to go into hiding? I mean, I don't understand that. Are they part of the conspiracy too? I mean, well, okay. The, 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 the people doing research have already identified some crisis actors people that are actors and they, they, they do the man on the street interview. There's a guy in a baseball cap that was interviewed by somebody from CNN. He said, oh, I saw both planes hit the towers. I mean, he was just, he, he was an enthusiastic actor re doing his part that day. And there were others around that, you know, were planted to give the eyewitness testimony of what we were, the events of the day. So on, on a lot of these major events, you have crisis actors in the first place. But to answer your question, Ask yourself, if somebody offered you, say, $20 million to assume a new, just take a plane ride and then assume a new identity and move to another country, would you do it for $20 million? Yeah, I'd do it. 
Uh, I wouldn't want to be part of Because 20, 20 million dollars ahead for, for the passengers on those planes to move them out to other countries and make them disappear, that's that small change compared to, the, compared to the profits that were made by the people that profit off of the insider stock trading that day. What do you so, do so how many people, people were on each plane? <laughs> well, you get killed. <laughs> <laughs> you know, if, you if you don't know that yet, you haven't studied. If you, if you don't know that people got killed during the Bush administration, you haven't been paying attention. Okay, Andy, it was hard enough for the press to cover up a second-rate burglary done by the Nixon administration. Why is it then that you? Why, why wasn't there any, like, big whistleblowers or people in there? Like I said, Watergate was just a second-rate burglary done by a bunch of insiders. Don't you think that we would have found the smoking gun in that of evidence by now? Because I've been looking at these 9-11 sites. I've been seeing most of the stuff on these sites thoroughly debunked. And I find it absolutely preposterous to believe that George Bush had the brains to even pull off an operation like this. Can you please comment? Well, you you missed the point of uh, you know the, the last fifty books on 9/11. If you're, you're you're putting the question up, did George Bush have the brains to do this? No, George wasn't really involved as so much as he was a patsy. George, they kept George out of the way. He was in a school reading a book with second graders, and then they loaded him on a plane and sent him out to Nebraska until all the main events were over. They kept George out of the way so he wouldn't come up the works uh, by you know, saying something out of turn, like uh, Donald Rumsfeld slipped up in one of his interviews. He says, oh yeah, uh, a missile hit the Pentagon. Oh, I'm sorry, no, that was uh, Flight 77. Uh, you, you see these slip-ups here and there, but the other question is, how they couldn't cover up the Watergate burglary. Didn't Watergate happen back in 73, yes. somewhere around there? We still had a semblance. We had investigative reporters that were investigating without worried about getting killed back in 1973. Today, if you investigate certain things, you and your family disappear. You know, that's the difference between then and now. And if it's not, not a fear of getting killed, you have big, huge, enormous money controlling the six six major media outlets. The you know, and also reporters in 1973, investigative reporters, didn't make a fraction of the money that these journalists on TV and everywhere else are making now, right? They're making big, big money, and they know that if they ruffle feathers or something, they can lose their cushy job. We don't have investigative reporters in America today or uh, an open media that could cover it like they did in 1973. Times were totally different. And that, that's why the media is not covering it. That's what, the point I've been making with censored news here for the last eight years that I've been giving talks. Our news is censored. It's a two-pronged process. They promote the myth, and they run a coordinated blackout on the scientists that have the facts. That's what's happening. All right, I've got a question Oh, he, he, he's got his hand up there. Oh, all right. Alright. Don't, don't we don't we need the military to protect oil interests of America? So we have enough oil to keep the lights on in this restaurant and keep cars running on the street, and cheap gas, and airplanes running. Don't we need the military to protect that? Yep. The question is, don't we need the military to protect our energy supplies? Yeah, uh, Smedley Butler wrote the book on it in 1935. He said, draw a line, a 200-mile radius around the United States and defend that. If we spent a fraction of the money that we're spending on the military, $2.1 million to keep a troop in Afghanistan, right? $2.1 million a year. Take that money. Bring that guy home and give him a Harvard education, tell him to stop guarding the pipeline over there, give him a Harvard education and give away 43 hybrids with the rest of the money to cut into the oil consumption. The, the energy efficiency revolution, how quick we can get off of foreign oil, is a tiny fraction of what we are currently spending on guarding oil supplies around the world. Amory Lovins out of Rocky Mountain, he had the best comment on it. He says, tell the Arabs to keep their ancient dinosaur residue. Leave it in the ground. We don't need it anymore. That's it. We, we do not need foreign oil. We're being maintained artificially dependent on it. 
Brown has a question. I remember back in 2001, 2003, marching against wars and protesting against uh, the invasion of Afghanistan and all sorts of things. Uh, there was a myth created that we were going to be saved by, you know, but there were also by, by having a war, uh, but there were counter myths uh, saying, oh, it didn't really happen, and it wasn't them, and maybe you should believe that it was a plot by the government or the insurance companies uh, or the, uh, the people who had insurance on the World Trade Towers. Uh, I, I'm sorry, but I think that it's easy to make up a myth and a counter myth. What's your question? Do you have a question? I, my question is how you, isn't it true that uh, the World Trade Towers were, were, uh, hit by planes that were guided by uh, mo Muslim uh, militants uh, who uh, were uh, under the uh, impression that they were making for a caliphate uh, in, uh, in the Middle East. Um, Bram, his question is expertly summarized for us, you know, the hoax that was created for us. He asked, isn't it true that the two planes that hit the towers were guided by Muslims, you know, hoping to start a, a religious war of some kind? Um, no, the pilots, as I talked about in Patriots Question 911, the pilots for 911 Truth have shown conclusively that it would be impossible, absolutely unthinkable, for a small a private plane pilot, somebody that had expertise steering a small plane, to sit down in the seat of a computer-controlled 757 jumbo jet and pilot that thing through the clouds anywhere near the towers, much less make the turns, the precision turns needed to hit each tower precisely on the first try. The pilots for 9-11 Truth think that the planes were flown by military GPS, autopilot, that can make corrections better and faster than a human pilot to hit a target like that on the very first try with no practice. They said, but the idea that those two perfect hits were done by Muslim hijackers, it's laughable on the face of it to anybody that has ever sat in a, a trainer uh, for a jumbo jet or even seen the cockpit. Okay. You're laughing it off. Huh? All right. No, the pilots are. I'm not laughing it off. The pilots are, and there's thousands of them. Yes. Who else had a question? Charlie. All right. Um, you in your sheet here, you say that the the buildings were converted to dust. Now, I have accounts of the buildings in Germany in World War II in London and Japan were converted to dust yeah. by the 8th Air Force. And here's, what does it mean they're converted to dust and this dustification? And you said something, the piles in the building, are you saying the mass of that building changed? This uh, the man, uh, changed. Okay. I mean, if you, one percent. if you had a building when you began, you got a building when you end. Are you saying well, it what, got smaller? I, well, well, I'll, I'll give you the, I'll give you an actual quote from one of the firefighters who was uh, under a firefighter and his chief were under the stairwell of one of the other buildings when the first tower came down, and when they came out, 
they're they're looking through there and then they can just see right right through where the tower used to be and a firefighter says you know they're looking up he says where, where's the rubble where's the building and the fire chief said when there's no real rubble pile on the ground when a building collapses you know something bad happened in the air they didn't know what yet they were in a state of shock but later analysis has shown that uh, some kind of explosive, the debate now is between some kind of new energy weapon or some kind of small directed neutron bombs like mini nukes that can also cause steel to dissolve. There's a mini nuke? Yeah, that, uh, that, that's, that's the current debate. The current debate among the two scientific camps about 9-11 is they, they both agree. They totally agree that the Twin Towers, basically 99% of the material was blown into dust and just rolled over Manhattan as a cloud of dust. There's no debate on that. The debate is what kind of explosives were packed into the buildings to do the work. So now there's a minute, maybe nuclear bomb okay. to set off? That's, that's the theory there. They've, they've been analyzing the dust samples found around the area and they've been finding uh, you know, 4,000 times more barium parts per million or strontium, things that come out of nuclear reactions. They won't come from office fires. They said they're finding signature trace elements well, you know, in the dust. One question I have, last one, I'll leave you alone. Why do you need the explosion using the, what was it? The, what was the term of the, the, that dust? That Dustification? Dust? No, the, you originally had the, uh, what was the name for the explosive paint that was? Thermite? So now, wait a minute. I've got thermite and the nuclear explosion and the dustification. There's a lot going on in this building, Andy. Right. This is exactly what we're saying. Char Charlie hit the nail right on the head. He's 100% correct. If you watch the films that are available, you will see all kinds of layers of explosives going off, moving down. It started at the top and went down faster than the speed of gravity. So the explosions were set off faster than the building was falling. And what, what we were watching was the dust cloud rolling down and out. It gave the impression that the buildings were collapsing, when in reality, what was, what was going down was the layers of explosives. And you can clearly see that in a lot of different videos. They've just never been shown on American TV by the American media. They just show us the big cloud and they tell us the buildings collapsed. But you're absolutely right. Yeah, if you look at uh, the videos on these different sites and the evidence, there's probably, there might have been four or five different kinds of explosives packed in the buildings. Some to cut the girders, some to uh, destroy the walls, some to blow up the concrete. They, they might have painted stuff, the explosive paint might have been there. Who knows? What they do agree on is it was a singular event that had nothing to do with the two plane crashes that hit the towers. Okay. Ellen? Okay. Um, Ellen. Don't you think that ISIS, um, don't you agree that they're they're massacring people <coughs> and uh, that they're very dangerous and they're, um, you know, they would like to commit genocide? I mean, well, the that question is... that we should try to do something to stop them? Okay. So the question, Ellen has an excellent question. She says, what about ISIS? They're, they're beheading people or they're killing people. You know, shouldn't we do something to stop that? Well, the world has 7 billion people. The world has 7 billion people. At some point, somewhere on the planet, there's going to be some people committing murder or committing crimes. And like if there's a serial, you know, when there was Son of Sam was a serial killer in New York, nobody advocated dropping an atomic bomb on New York to get rid of that serial killer. They went after him with police, investigators. This is how you go after criminals. The idea that there's there's a few criminals here, so they, they hate America and we have to send you know, our Marines over there, or the Navy, to take over their country because they've got some criminals that are killing people, that's manufactured for the benefit of the American public. That's what, what Smedley Butler was talking about. War is a racket. 
you have to have constant conflict to justify the military industrial complex that's that's you're you're at your hundred percent on in asking that question and if more and more people would answer that question they say well do we actually need fifty billion dollars to go after four people that are they're beheading people why don't why don't we send two send two dozen of our uh, hitmen over there or something the mafia is always be able to find people and hit them when they want to why don't we hire them we don't need a whole military to do that right <laughs> Okay. Okay. Thousands and thousands. Okay. Okay. All right. Louder, please. The initial information shows, yeah, that uh, ISIS just didn't spring up uh, out of the out of the clear blue sky. They're being funded by intelligence agencies. And um, you know, our CIA has its fingers into all kinds of things, and uh, they, you know, they, they're they're involved in helping. They they foment, uh, they fund radicals. They find radicals somewhere and fund them. And then when these radicals start killing people with the weapons we gave them, they say, "Oh, it's a great crisis. We got to go over there and do something about that." And uh, it's it's been an ongoing thing, where there a lot of information is beginning to. Uh, come to the fore, you could probably talk about this for an hour some night, the drone program, you know, targeting people with drones. His, history may come to show that the drone program is actually designed to create pockets of hatred for America so that uh, they will start killing Americans or the embassy. And, uh, you know, when, when people just get killed out of the clear blue sky, uh, you know, they hate the people that did it. And you know, there, there's there's a lot of a lot of articles being written now showing that there were no pockets of terrorism, Al, Al Qaeda or these others, before America got involved. I mean, uh, you know, almost everywhere we're getting involved, that's where the terrorists are popping up, and it's it's a it's a big problem. And also, if you overlay a map of where these pockets are, you'll see it's over oil-rich deposits in other countries where we our our, our billionaires want to occupy it. That's what's going on. <laughs> Do you have a second question, uh, I, I mean, there are thousands and thousands of ISIS members. It's not like. We can just send over a few assassins and get them. Well, yeah, it's we we think there's thousands and thousands of them, but you can't tell if you're getting the actual numbers correct from the mainstream media. Watch how the media covers protests. If there's two dozen Tea Party members out there complaining about President Obama, they they say it was thousands of protesters. Yeah. But if there's 100,000 protesters marching for a better living wage, they'll say, oh, there's a few hundred out there, maybe a thousand or two. The press just totally lies to us about the numbers, depending on what they want us to believe. And that's why you have to search good, credible websites and stop looking at mainstream news on any of this. No, Tim. Okay. Um, I still find uh, your talk was uh, tonight was basically on um, you know cult-like mythology in America and, and really all we heard tonight was another rehash of your 9-11 and your standard speech when are we going to hear more talks on what the point is on the that's scheduled on the website oh Tim's question is one uh I mean, I'm not, I'm just, I'm just asking. Well, okay, uh, to answer your question, the major, the major pieces of mythology that are driving what's happening in America is one, the myth of 9-11, two, the myth that our soldiers are fighting for freedom and justice over there. Right. Uh, third one, the myth that uh, our unemployment situation is going down and we're in an economic recovery. That's a total myth. And four, What's the other one? Um, George W. Bush was elected president. The, you know, the, 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 that, that, uh, the mythology that our whole political system, the, the, the people that are getting into office of who we're actually voting for, and these, these are all linked together 
in the war on the middle class in America and the, you know, the grab for resources around the world. Okay, now you know, These four major myths are, are what they form the core of what's going on in America. Okay, we are, we're on that, with that being understanding and coming from my Toastmasters background, why didn't you concentrate on those four myths? Talked about the methodology of why those myths were propagated, how they can be propagated, and what we should do to to stop it. I mean, it it just was not on point. Okay, uh, you you missed the point of my talk again. What I'm talking about is the yeah, first guess. step is recognizing that the media is lying to us. The solutions are right in front of our faces. You 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 get credible information and you learn what's happening and it's not hard to understand. And when I look at that same credible information, I believe completely the opposite of what you do. I've been looking at this stuff. Well, apparently we're looking at two different sites. No, a bunch. I'm, I've been watch, looking at your stuff. I uh, you know, yeah, I, I, I'm, I'm, I'm having trouble with people saying they're looking at my stuff. It's not my stuff initially. No, I know. It's people, it's, it's journalism professors that have 30 years experience in investigative and some, journalism. And some of you it's have quite to good. actually read one of their books. You can't just look at it and say, well, that's a bunch of hooey. I have. You, you have to, well, then all I can tell you is you're having a fundamental problem facing reality. I don't think uh, so. <laughs> Because at some I, point... I, I it, don't think so. The, I, I would concur it, and reverse it. It's right I mean, there. It's right there on, on the thing I put tonight. What, 30 what? and 7. You need a 30% open mind and a 7th grade education. And that's and exactly it, what I got. And I conclude you, you, the other You have things. more than that. And you're, All right. Yeah. All right. It, but I, I want to put make this real clear. I'm not putting you down or your beliefs. I, I disagree with you on a lot of this stuff. But I'm not also not going to say I'm going to put you down because of it. You know, I know you're trying to think this stuff in a very clear and thoughtful way. I just happen to look at the same stuff and disagree. Now, that doesn't mean I'm not going to put down your dignity or your belief system. You follow? And I want to make that point very clear to everybody in this college. Okay. We try. Uh, yeah, just, uh, yeah, just uh, kind of a... Uh, question or, or point here, um, you know, from a mental health point of view, the issue of uh, mythology or beliefs is it's a big issue. A lot of people who are delusional, for example, you know, they believe, say, uh, somebody in their family is poisoning them. You have a big problem because once the person is crossed over and signed on to a belief, they will normally, if they are given evidence to refute the belief, uh, such as, you know, analyzing the food, what will happen is they will tend to rationalize it or minimize it away. And whether it's a belief that most people would consider to be delusional or it's a belief that, you know, 9-11 happened the way, exactly the way it was presented, and uh, especially when it's given by an authority figure or authority figures, uh, we're programmed to pretty much, uh, once you sign on to it or you make a decision that that's how it was, you won't walk it back very easily. And that becomes a major problem in trying to re-educate people or to get people to be able to go through a process of sorting out information. And I just thought I'd you know, throw that out there. It makes it difficult. Well, well, the question is, if you are going to combat uh, these mythologies that are put out by the news media, say, uh, what is it that could be done on a practical level or, you know, something with considerable efficacy to change people's minds? Because, uh, again, once somebody is signed on to a belief, try to get them to walk it back. What's your thought on that? There's the question. Okay. Um, he, the question was, what can we do to help people combat these you know, false beliefs once they've signed on to it. Well, the only thing I know how to do is show people in simple terms uh, sources like there's a quote in the censored news book 
the new, it says news abuse in America, and the quote is, when a well-packaged web of lies has been sold gradually to the masses over generations, the truth will seem utterly preposterous and a speaker a raving lunatic. We are living in the first step. I, I talk to people all the time. They say, well, a friend of mine gave a DVD of 9-11 uh, to a friend of his at work. And she said, well, my views of the government have changed. I, I, once you step through the door and look at the evidence with an open mind, you realize this is reality. You can't go back. That's why these websites are called portal websites. It's a portal or a doorway into the other world where the blacked out news is. Once you step over that threshold, once you find out that the Catholic priest you trusted for 20 years has been abusing kids, you can't go back to supporting him like you used to before. And not all priests are doing that. There's a lot of really honest ones. But what I'm saying is, your question is absolutely right. When people uh, are faced with a fact that is going to shock their belief, the natural human instinct is to just deny it or shoot the messenger. And we, knowledge spreads according to, you know, person to person and people opening their minds. And when, when the public reaches critical mass, then you can no longer have a popular viewpoint. Yeah, I, I mean, because, you know, what happens is just like Tim? here. Yeah, we're going to. Uh, people begin to uh, kind of rationalize away a certain, let's say, body of evidence that you're pointing out. Because, you know, it can become, well, you're pointing out other evidence or other stories, and, you know, why, why should we trust these as opposed to what the authorities say, who we basically have been taught to trust. Uh, so, you know, it, it is a very, very difficult kind of a problem, and as you pointed out, uh, I forget what the uh, question, but back in the days when you had the Nixon White House and Watergate, it was a completely different country, and as you pointed out, you had a critical news media that existed, and that meant that you had the authority of the news media actually uh, taking Nixon and the other people who were involved in that down. He was actually had to resign. Today you have nothing like that. It doesn't exist. Okay. It's just that for the reasons you pointed out, right? You know, yeah, the only, yeah, the only solution I know of is to help people start with something simple. Give them a copy of Censor News and just say, read some of this and take a look. This is not Democrat or Republican. This is how the news media shapes and molds our opinions. That's what we have in America today. Quarter past eight. Uh, I think that it, how many people have their versions of reality <laughs> versus a myth uh, that they would like to present to us tonight? One, two, three, four, maybe five. We'll go with five. We'll go. All right. Uh, Five minutes, six? About five minutes uh, each. Uh, and, uh, we'll let Andy do Okay. Then, of course, uh, a five minute wrap or something. Three minutes. Right, let's let's, let's get back here. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, David. You're set. Sorry. Hands against the wall, guys. All right, Mr. Travis, you're on. I, uh, I once saw a movie. I can't remember the name of it. But in the movie, it was like everyone had their own brand of insanity. And uh, this one guy says, this is a ship of fools. I think that might have been the name of the movie, Ship of Fools. 
in any event, uh, this whole thing sort of reminds me of that. <laughs> we have one guy that wants to convert everybody to communism. We got another guy running around who wants to, uh, who says that uh, sodium molten thorium salt will uh, cure the uh, energy problem of the earth. It's called flora, liquid fluoride, fluoride, thorium our reactors. Speaker, our speaker uh, thinks there's a conspiracy behind of every bush. And uh, we got another guy here who thinks that uh, plastic shit is the uh, a cause of the world's problems. And I could go on and on. But uh, my main question is none of those things. My main question is, in the words of Sherman Kaplan, the restaurant critic, how much could it cost to heat a bathroom? I think you just read an apt description in the College of Complexes. Okay, next. Let's get, that's an open mic. Next, please. Who's next in rebuttal? If the rest of you aren't ready, I'll give what I can give. Uh, I actually wrote down a couple of uh, All right. As I said before, back in 2001, uh, when Pat Butler was uh, saying that we've got to invade Afghanistan and teach the Taliban and uh, the uh, to respect America. Uh, actually, they they did respect us as donors, uh, uh, but they also respected uh, the uh, Al Qaeda people who had uh, been arming them and funding them. Uh, who, sometimes with CIA money, but mostly with uh, Arab money, uh, for, mostly from Saudi Arabia. Uh, people who, there who didn't like uh, King Saud, uh, or his uh, successor, who was it, Abdullah? Anyway, uh, and, and we're looking for a truly Muslim, uh, Wahhabi Muslim uh, answer to uh, uh, the degradation of uh, Muslim culture and, and uh, situation in the world. Uh, well, they had their myth. Uh, Apparently, uh, uh, Butler had his myth, oh, uh, the U.S. military will solve all the problems. Uh, and there were a lot of us peaceniks uh, who wanted to, to question authority in that, this situation. Uh, some of us, uh, wanted to believe that it was not the Muslims uh, united to take over the world that were the enemy, but uh, George uh, uh, W. and uh, company uh, and, uh, and the uh, U.S. military. Uh, for people like that, it was helpful to believe that 9-11 uh, was caused by the government rather than uh, Muslim uh, saboteurs. Uh, unfortunately, there had been a raid on the World Trade Towers before. There have been raids on 
on uh, the Pentagon or attempted raids on the Pentagon before. Uh, and uh, so it was quite believable that, uh, that there were Muslim enemies of uh, not, not just Muslims, I mean, uh, <laughs> they, every Muslim is not uh, concerned with uh, of building up some sort of a caliphate. Uh, they maybe like to have uh, uh, their religion more respected uh, than they'll get uh, in a predominantly uh, non-Muslim uh, country like the United States. Uh, well, it's easy to make up myths as uh, as our speaker has demonstrated, uh, and uh, I'm afraid that there are myths and there are counter myths, and uh, I don't think that one should be too credulous about either the myth or the counter myth. All right, next. Okay, <clears throat> I'm going to be having another talk on 9-11 uh, on May 16th. Uh, I had, <laughs> thank you. I had a whole lot of material to get through uh, in my last uh, talk and I didn't get to all of it at all. So I uh, hope you all will, uh, will be there at, the, at that next one. Um, the war on terror, uh, quote unquote, is going on full steam under this administration. The U.S. Uh, has uh, decided to rule the world. Um, that's uh, the decision that's been made by the leadership of this country for decades now, uh, starting with the neocons, or even before then, but certainly w uh, with Cheney, the, uh, the Bush Cheney gang and uh, all his neocon friends. So the U.S. is all over the place. It has tentacles all over the Middle East. It has an, uh, the CIA has an unlimited budget. It creates terrorists out of, out of the blue. It, it literally it, it, it recruits terrorists. Uh, the head of the uh, embassy in, in Saudi Arabia, uh, who left because he was disenchanted, uh, he said he said that um, it was literally a CIA uh, terrorist recruiting center. Okay, so uh, they get guys um, uh, from all over the Middle East and and give them weapons, uh, give them uh, quote unquote ideologies, etc. ISIS. What is ISIS? Okay. Uh, ISIS is probably largely created by uh, the U.S. Uh, first, uh, from uh, Al Qaeda. Uh, secondly, as a reaction to its, our invasion of uh, the U.S.'s invasion of Iraq, um, most of the violence going on there, uh, regardless of its form, um, it has been fomented by the United States uh, with its imperial project. So, uh, what business does the U.S. have going into the, into uh, uh, Iraq and bombing anybody for any reason? Okay. Uh, so somebody beheads somebody. Oh, really? We're supposed to be uh, up in arms about uh, one guy beheading one, another guy? The U.S. bombs people regularly, killing thousands of people, uh, almost on a daily basis, uh, with drones, with uh, artillery strikes, with submarine uh, uh, cruise missile strikes, um, or just our infantry, slaughtering people left and right with their freaking machine guns. Uh, would you rather have your head blown off with a machine gun or, or with a knife? Okay, so well, the U.S. has no business going anywhere, uh, uh, attacking anybody. Uh, the U.S. is a sovereign country. It should mind its own business. If it has a problem, it should go to the U United Nations. Unfortunately, the, U the U.N. Is, is nothing but a tool of the U.S. So 9-11 um, was the start of this uh, totally uh, obscene, quote-unquote, war on terror. Uh, as Andy says, it was the dark force that started it all. And it's a huge fairy tale. Uh, Brown, there are fairy tales, and there's the truth. And the fairy tale is the official story of 9-11. The truth is that there were no, not even any airliners hitting any buildings. And that's demonstrable. And I'll continue to demonstrate that on, 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 in my next presentation. So we have a lot of thinking to do. And, and thanks to Andy for his talk. Uh, we have myths in this country that are ruling us. That, that we, we're, we're being brainwashed uh, constantly in this country. And we have to break out of it. Um, we're in a prison for our minds, as they say, as the guy said in The Matrix. Thank you. Huh? No, a word from our
from our sponsor. No, I, I don't think it's a word from our sponsor, but to be honest tonight, I know Andy has researched his uh, books well. I know he thoroughly believes in what he does, but frankly, I still can't believe it. I firmly believe that the Twin Towers were brought down by two jetliners crashing into two buildings and that it was done for about, you know, by Osama bin Laden. And I'm sorry, but I still believe the government things on it. Now, as far as U.S. foreign policy is concerned, I firmly believe that our next century is going to want to be one of peace and prosperity. I firmly believe that the trends that we're seeing in the world are going to be more more towards the leaning of peace. And a lot of it with Ted is frankly called Pax Americana. We are the big boys on the block. We prevent a lot of wars, and I think our largest export is what we call security. Thank you. Thank you very if you much. keep the sea lanes open and free trade flowing, that's a prescription for world peace. When you're trading with another country, two democracies are not going to go pretty much to war against each other. Now, I do know, and I'm very aware of the drone strikes and the misinterpretations of the American military, but I'll still tell you, I still think the greatest creation in the last 200 years was that of the general revenue bond and the creation of the corporation and the form of governance that they have. The reason I believe that is because the evidence clearly states that it has brought prosperity to the rest of the world. I firmly believe that globalization is the key to bringing world peace and prosperity. I also firmly believe that, according to the World the Gates report, that within 15 years this abject poverty is going to be eliminated because of the spread of globalization. For you've seen it for the last 300 years where people are starting to prosper. Yes, the rich are getting richer, and yes, we do have some form of wage stagnation in this country, but we've been here before. And a hundred years ago, we founded through antitrust laws and unionization. To me, where I see the real crime is that our labor has not stood up for itself big enough to demand the higher wages. And we're starting to finally see that in this country. Or the breakups of some of the larger corporate entities that think that we can do it. But I think the biggest threat that we see to America right now is, is just the spread of, you know, the myths of, of things like solar's going to do it all. Like, we know there's climate change out there, but if, if, if we took half the resources we spend on climate change and put them into social programs like education and uh, building of, of infrastructure and other things, I think we could weather out the storm. Now, getting off of fossil fuels, it's a simple enough. I know I prescribed uh, the thorium nuclear power reactor and the way it goes, but I honestly think that's the only way we're going to do it. And on April 18th, we're going to have a good debate on that subject. Now, I wish, too, that uh, the biggest thing right now, what creates most of, the, most of the problems in the world, is the lack of government recognizing property rights of its, of its citizens. And if you really look at it, in a book called The Mystery of Capital by Hernando de Soto, he describes this problem very well. For example, right after World War II, the first thing they did was they registered, they got all the property and titles and the names of the people who actually lived there and owned them. And then they were able to make a, make a capitalistic market in order to buy, sell, and trade property and goods and services. And over the next 30 years, were able to build their wealth, which is what's happening in a lot of these third world countries today. It's not a matter of redistribution of the wealth. It's a matter of getting the capitalistic tools into the poor who need it the most and not some pie-in-the-sky governmental redistribution. And as far as the conspiracy theories and 9-11 are concerned, I firmly believe that you could not pull this kind of caper off with the amount of, without, without some kind of people coming out and talking about it, more uh, whistleblowers being made. I mean, where are the people in the building who planted the explosive, surely somebody would have come talking by now. Where are the people who came in? And who are the people that uh, did whatever? Now, I'm a rambling a little bit. I'm hoping at some point to give a thorough talk on why I believe we're in for the next best, most prosperous 
next hundred years, if uh, we can get up here sometime and let me fully explain my uh, belief system. If we can have our man Andy Anderson up here, surely we could present the other side. And I believe we are on September 13th. Anyway, thank you. I'll be nice. You apologize to Andy, right? No, I didn't apologize. Well, I'm Oh, no. Andy gave a great college talk, as usual. Uh, as far as uh, <laughs> other opinions besides the ABC, NBC, and CBS, um, there's always Noam Chomsky to listen to on YouTube, like I do every once in a while. And uh, he's a what? Anyways, Chomsky is, is very, uh, he has other opinions besides the main media um, that Andy always talks about. And um, he's very uh, available on YouTube anytime. As far as um, Tim and his um, <laughs> labor, freedom. Uh, what about Walmart, the greatest capitalist example today with 300,000 uh, employees and they don't let unions in the company and they're afraid of unions. They pay, uh, there are highly paid lawyers and labor uh, fighters who Walmart hires to to fire any uh, employee that talks about a union or attempts to uh, organize. So, I mean, I don't see the labor freedom in the next, in the 21st century that Tim is talking about. Thank you. All right, let's thank our speaker again. Thank you, Lord. All right. All right. Um, I hope I can get home without being put in the witness protection. <laughs> I gotta be careful what role I take, you know. No, I'm just picking on the end here. Uh, all right, many years ago, as a young man, I got a degree in library and information science. And one of the things I had to do was study censorship. And I think that's the topic tonight. Is there, in fact, someone controlling information? Um, also, subsequent to that, I had positions in book publishing. I worked for magazines and also haven't done PR work with the mass media, part of the National Writers Union over the years as well. So I get some exposure to information sources. Um, where do we get our information? Um, you can get a telephone call, you get emails today, uh, you may look at a newspaper, um, you listen to the radio in your car. Uh, I think everybody watches an hour or two of TV uh, a day. Uh, some people like Andy like to buy books. Uh, people also purchase occasional magazines. Um, now we have, you might even talk to your friends. Uh, you may talk to people you think are knowledgeable in a certain area and rely upon them for information. And certainly we have a thing called the internet, which websites, and now they have even cheapo websites, Facebook and things like that. And cable, you have somewhere like 1,000 channels um, to deal with. Are you guys done with your change here? Um, anyhow, how do you affect censorship? I mean, the other day I put 
a, a press release out and I sent it to 100 people, at least 100, 150 media sources all over town. And sometimes they print it instantly these days. They put it up, they write it up, and they put it on the website. Um, and I've been interviewed live on publications, so how can there be censorship? Please, guys, all right, one pull at a time over there. Um, but how, how can you affect censorship if they're broadcasting live? And this internet stuff is basically instantaneous. I'm serious. Uh, you can get done talking with a reporter, and um, about an hour or so later, you'll hear the story on the radio or uh, see it in print. How do you, how do, and do you know how many people are involved in the, the, the fields that I just described, publishing, magazine, broadcast, journalism? Just the Chicago market alone is several thousand people. So how do you control this? It's, it's not something you can put your arms around. I don't know how you affect control. I've been, and I've discussed this, there was Leanne Kasson's a friend of mine, she had the media organization here and she's been preaching this for you. Oh yes, it's, and I've always heard this, there's three, three media companies that control everything. That's, that's, that's just not the case. There are collectives and things like that and assemblage, particularly in the radio industry that's starting now, but there's no means, by any means, a central. I just have no idea, and I want to hear it. You say, well, there's, it's, it's like this argument, well, there's a gardener, and, but I, I don't know what's being censored. As a matter of fact, I don't see anything being censored. It's all censored. Nothing. You're blind. At, tell me what is being said. How do you do it? How do you do it? Very easily. Do you know how many? Never say it's a war. There are at least war on the media. There are at least one thousand people involved in in radio alone. So what? In Chicago, how are they controlled? By fear. They don't, they don't, By fear. I just told you. Are you listening to me? They will interview me live on the what air. That's a common thing. Done. Not taking the SUV when they the interview me on live, how can you uh, be uh, controlled? It's left out. It's no, it's not. What are you talking no. about? All the time. <laughs> yes, it isn't. Yeah, it, trust the media. it isn't. <laughs> Most of the time you're interviewed live. <laughs> Didn't you know that? Yeah, they cut it out the importance. No. No. E no. Yes. I regularly go on the radio in Washington. Yeah, they edit out whatever they want. No. Yes, they do. It's live radio. So you don't talk about anything important. <laughs> 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 yes, I've never heard of it. I've never seen it happen. <laughs> Where is it? Show me something that was censored. The burden of proof is on you. I want to know a story that was censored. They all are. No, they're not. Now he comes up with a book. Every of, of feature articles that were not published. Well, do you think every press release that I sent out gets published? everywhere I send it and so it doesn't get published or put on the radio broadcast or something then I could say oh see they are censoring Charles because they didn't print my silly press release because they only got about 12,000 that day and there's a competition for a very limited space do you think newspapers have a thousand pages do you think they're like Books? Do you have any comprehension of the media at all? Have you ever seen a directory? Fox News. Have you ever seen a directory? You're a librarian. What's a directory? How big is a directory for magazines, books, for Chicago? How many names? 
Oh, a lot. How, well, what's a lot? Not For the Chicago the market. They'll bury the important stores huh? in the back. They, they They're are. all controlled robotically? No, by the way. That's ridiculous. <laughs> You've got to have a central source and control people. I work for a bureaucracy, the federal government, and that's how you exercise control. And these people have no entity. I don't see any evidence of how they are controlled. Now, in a bureaucracy, in the, no, in a bureaucracy, they have a means of communications, orders, it's all set up. But these are people disparate all over the place. Right, Andy? Where do you all control the them? The the no. How do you communicate? How do you convey that this story is prohibited to all those people? How do I tell five thousand people this story is not allowed? It's a minute that they will be sued. How do I tell them? Uh, give them how do I call them? Give them an example. What? How do I call them? But okay. Who is the next speaker? All right. Set up there, Charlie. Just tell them. Just tell them. Look out now, boy. Go ahead, boy, Mike. All right. All right. All right. How do, you, how do you account for all the main medias having all the same, they're all independent, right? How do you account for them all having the same lead stories? It's called a newswire service, my friend. Yeah, they're it started, real good media. It started, it started under, uh, it, it started, it's been around the for The media sucked years. ever since Ted, Ted Koppel was the last honest person in the media. He sent out a press release, I get a call within five minutes. Yeah. What are you talking all right. about? Yeah, about what? Andy, I agree with everything. Rain on the street or something? You will. What's the censorship? All right. As I've always said, Osama bin Laden had his planes, his American Boeing planes, run into the Pentagon and the World Trade Centers because they were symbols of America the military, the globalization of the military and the globalization of uh, Wall Street and business. And I agree with everything what Andy says about how um, after 9-11, Cheney and Bush, probably Cheney probably, spun this into an endless war and an oil war that will not end. And go to HalliburtonWatch.org and it'll explain everything why we want to have uh, endless oil wars and be in the Middle East. Um, I'm not in 100% agreement when it comes to, um, you know, how those buildings came down. But that's all right. Andy, I would really like your, your name of your company. You're, you're probably the best journalist in Chicago, the smartest. And... I, you're, you're called the Northwest Information Bureau, and that seems very um, um, uh, not uh, what's it what's, what's what's the term? Well, I would like to see you have all these great global issues. I wish you'd change the name from the Northwest Information Service to like the uh, Global Information Service, and then we could actually get you your your stories out in the public and the mainstream media where they need it. Um, it's about all I have to say. Uh, but yeah, we need more. We need to watch the media more. It's it's really gotten bad since it's so corporate and commercial. Okay. Thank you. I guess no more speakers. Okay, Andy, it's rebuttal time. It's rebuttal time, Andy. Andy, you're on. Next thing we're going to be here about hearing about is how our benefit panel was a true patriot. Okay, uh, thank you all for coming. 
And I think I'll start with, where did Charlie go? Uh, we scared him away. Uh. <laughs> 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 well, the first speaker, uh, his question was, uh, how much does it really cost to heat a bathroom? Uh, that's a good suggestion. I think the restaurant should take that in stride. And uh, maybe uh, if you look at the, the bottom line, though, uh, people don't linger in a bathroom if they're freezing their ass off. <laughs> <laughs> they get out quick. So uh, you know, there may be method to the madness there of the unheated bathrooms. <clears throat> One of the reasons uh, it seems like uh, a lot of issues are related to 9-11 is, is because 9-11 is the dark force that is driving <laughs> a lot of bad things that are happening in America. And if, if the issue of 9-11 is solved, then we can free up a lot of money to solve a whole bunch of other issues, human rights issues, all kinds of things. For those of you that still believe that two plane crashes brought down the equivalent of two giant steel redwood trees being hit by an empty beer can, um, I don't know what to tell you other than you have a, a fundamental perceptual handicap. So then I guess I got one. Um, at, at some point, at some point, uh, the refusal to believe reality in front of your face becomes obstruction of justice when we're dealing with a crime. Uh, it's okay to believe the White Sox are better than the Cubs. Uh, they or are. the Cubs are better than the White Sox. Well, the Cubs but are better than the White Sox. Ne neither team is killing women and children on a routine basis. Um, although they, they do break a lot of hearts every year, I have to say that. Mm. But, <sighs> as we said at the start, yeah, you, you don't need an open mind for this. You need a 30% open mind. You, you need the willingness to just look at a little bit of the evidence with an open mind and then it's easy to understand. Uh, to understand that 9-11 was not done by a surprise attack from terrorists, there's a few coincidences that were spelled out. Well, number one, seven buildings were destroyed and only two plane crashes hit. Number two, there was massive insider trading on Wall Street a few days before 9-11. Uh, they knew American and United were going to take a hit with their stock prices. Number three, uh, many of you may not be aware that our Congress passed the Patriot Act without reading it. They weren't given printed copies to read until after they passed it. And the Patriot Act was prepared well before 9-11. Our troops were getting all their shots and their gear together and everything to go into Afghanistan to hunt for Osama. The troops were getting ready in May and June of 2001, several months before the supposed surprise attack. 9-11 wasn't a surprise to the insiders that planned and orchestrated it. Charlie gave probably what is the best example we have seen about how news gets censored. If you, you can work for years and years and years putting out press releases, and if you never send out a press release on some subject that's sensitive that the billionaires don't want us to know, you can spend your whole career never being censored. And so you can say, well, I was never censored, so I can't believe there's any censorship. I would say to Charlie, try sending out a press release uh, showing that 9-11 uh, was an inside job. Uh, send out a press release about, see what kind of response you get. Uh, send a press release out about the World Health Organization, the report they put out in June of 2008. It's going to be seven years ago, this June, the World Health Organization put out a report saying, the heterosexual AIDS epidemic is over. 
we're sorry, we made a mistake. It's, it's not a heterosexual, heterosexual infectious disease at all. It's something else. That's been reported around the world. But you try to talk about that on the air or send out a release or make a phone call to a journalist, they will hang up on you. They'll pretend they didn't hear you. They'll run the other way. That's uh, never happened. The editors tell them what uh, Charlie said that never happened. Uh, well, which part never happened? What are you yeah, talking about? Running away. The no, I, I, well, it's, uh, that's what I'm telling you. You you haven't been involved in blacked out subjects, so yeah, you're not involved in radioactive subjects. So people won't run away from you when you try to talk to a reporter. There, all I can tell you. For anybody that wants to understand censorship in America. Uh, one of the excellent books you can get, I don't have a copy of it here tonight, I usually have it when I give a, a, a news talk out, uh, the book called Into the Buzzsaw, that's the title of it, Into the Buzzsaw, if you think there's no censorship, read the 18 stories of people that lost their jobs and careers because they were censored by the news media or they were fired because they wouldn't lie to the American people in a news story. They were all journalists with good credentials. Some of them had Pulitzer Prizes and one day their career just went into the buzzsaw, got shredded and they were fired and blackballed because they were trying to report a story that the top billionaire owners do not want to get out to the American public. As a case in point, in the last In the last few weeks, uh, yes, if those of you that have been just listening to mainstream news may have heard or seen a lot of articles saying that we should all get our kids vaccinated, everybody should get vaccinated with the flu shots and everything, it's no problem and it's, it's a myth, it's a total myth that there's anything harmful in the vaccines that, that can cause any kind of illness or, you know, that uh, they put the myth to bed that that uh, thimerosal uh, mercury-based compound in the vaccines was harmful. Well, today, uh, or yesterday actually, on uh, Tom Hartman's show, Robert Kennedy was interviewing, he was being interviewed by Tom Hartman and they were talking about a senior official from the CDC has just applied for protection as a whistleblower. There's a whistleblower law that protects whistleblowers from retaliation if they blow the whistle on a uh, government program or something. Well, he's out of the CDC and he's blowing the whistle on the fact that he was uh, ordered by his superiors to cover up the studies showing that the thimerosal mercury in vaccines is one of the causes of brain damage and autism and other things in young children. In the, in the back of this book, I'll give you a one sentence quote. It says, the evidence of thimerosal's neurotoxicity is now so overwhelming that anyone who is willing to read the science must conclude that thimerosal can cause brain damage. There's all kinds of studies all over the world showing that that thimerosal that was used as a preservative in vaccines is one of the driving causes behind all kinds of neurological damages, damage in infants and young children. The science is solid. So why did the mainstream media feel necessary to inundate us the last few weeks with all kinds of articles showing that there's no problem is because Robert Kennedy and the others, the, the others are building a bigger and bigger and bigger pyramid, a database. What's showing is just the tip of the iceberg. And once you get, it's what I call you know, elders of society, uh, people that have hundreds of years collectively experience in the field, that's different from somebody with an opinion. And uh, the, the science on asbestos is very solid. The science on mercury poisoning and in the brain damage, uh, low level exposure to mercury and lead, had, that's been solid for several decades now, but the vaccine industry is a multi-billion dollar industry. So when they get a new vaccine approved, uh, the company that puts it out makes a billion dollars in profit or more. We're looking at conditions today in America that are different 
than they were in the 1970s when we had an investigative press. Check the library, get a copy of that book into the bus or, or order a paperback copy yourself, read it, digest it, and begin to understand how the censorship comes from the top down on certain subjects that are classified as radioactive in America. If you try to talk about it, it'll cost you your job. You know, if you never talk about one of those subjects, if you talk about just, uh, um, you know, fixing potholes in the street or we need a new stop sign over here or it would be nice to do some improvements to the red line, these things aren't radioactive. You're not going to lose your job over sending out press releases on all kinds of hundreds of other things. But if you start talking about the radioactive ones, like I've been trying to, you know, bring examples here over the last seven years, that's what happens. So, all I can tell you is, for those of you that still can't face the reality that we have evil people in this country that could give us something like 9-11 for profit, the evidence is there, and it's overwhelming. And uh, it's available in any form you want it. Audio, video, book, uh, reports, hundreds of thousands of person years of documented evidence is available, readily available for anybody that's willing to look at it. Now, you had a quick question? Yeah, well, I was going to say, um, yeah, that guy who used to work for Newsweek, yes. he, I think he reported that uh, Colin Powell was uh, involved in covering up the My Lai uh, massacre, and now he doesn't work for Newsweek anymore. Yeah, like, Ellen has just made a point. Uh, some guy that worked for Newsweek uh, pointed out that Colin, Colin Powell was involved in the cover-up of the My Lai Massacre. Colin Powell wasn't just involved recently in promoting the, the Gulf War myth and everything else. He's been involved in military cover-ups for his whole career. And it's the same as the point I made today. The people that assassinated Kennedy and pushed our country in a different direction, a lot of those same people have been in the, in the Reagan Bush administration and in, in some are even in the Obama administration now shaping and molding the direction the country is going in. As Ted has pointed out many times, you know, we need a new democratic revolution, a revolution of democratic thought, a different way of doing business. And you know, what I, I, one of the things that Tom Hartman talks about all the time is that we're in our 35th year now. We're heading into our 35th year of Reaganomics. We are living in the greatest failure of a governing ideology in the history of the human race. The idea that you can shovel money to billionaires in unregulated capitalism and that it will benefit all people in the country. Our, our, our middle class is being eliminated and devastated by this. And so the first step is helping your friends and neighbors learn what's going on. Okay, I have a question. That, uh, Indeed, one can... last question. Okay, so, so I would like to know your opinion um, about, um, I hear sometimes like Russian Ukrainian show, Medical Holistic, you know, show, and it's exactly, they talked about, you talked about, um, controversial about vaccination. So what do you think, it's really mercury in the any vaccination, like, uh, I guess, like measles and, and even cold? To answer her question, she said, what about a vaccine? The controversy, the, the, we've been misled by the media thinking that the people, the people, there's, you know, two groups, people that promote vaccination and people that are anti-vaccine. Well, what this, the doctor that wrote the preface to this book, he said, I am very, very pro-vaccination. Vaccinations have helped get rid of a lot of diseases worldwide. He said, what I'm against is putting poisonous mercury in the vaccination. He said, other countries have, have uh, you know, clearly uh, have clean vaccinations without um, the poisonous neurotoxins in the mercury. That's, that's the whole uh, crux of the debate on uh, the, the, what do you call it, the, the hazards, the hazards of vaccination. It's not so much the vaccine itself, it's is the mercury that uh, causes neurological damage in babies and young people. Andy, there's so, a whole USA Today video that says none of those ingredients are dangerous. Oh yeah, they lie. Well, USA Today is lying. 
Charlie just made a good point. You know, that it was stuff you see on USA Today and the others. When, when now, Charlie made the point exactly what USA Today has been doing is what USA Today and the others did on when they they put out the studies from the Tobacco they Institute. Studying, they put out the study saying there's no problem with secondhand smoke. All the media put that out to slow down the spread of the knowledge that is moving up through the lawsuits through the courts. That's how knowledge spreads in America with lawsuits getting bigger and bigger until finally the media can't keep promoting these studies saying there's no hazard. If it's USA Today, CNN, ABC, that's mainstream news. What, you know, and uh, you, you have to look at it with a really critical eye and look at exactly what they're saying. But don't you think it's controversial? Well, excuse me, Andy, can I just say that that we'll, that we'll wrap it up. Very much you heard of the map of the Anyone who has read the book, it's like yes, one level above. In the book, people is down here. People is down here. Here's USA Today. They were doing bombing in the book. Well, that's what they were doing. They were doing bombing in the book. 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 Our news media is involved in Orwellian stuff, but that's that's the point, and it's up to us to help people learn. Well, thank you all for coming, and we'll wrap it up here. If anybody wants any information or a card or anything with the websites on it, come see me afterwards. Here, People magazines will always check in the wall for information, right? People magazines? Yeah. yeah. And the USA Today is a little bit of both. Well, I, I, I did hear that in, in Europe they told you that.